Welcome back to Module 6. We're going to be continuing our discussion of the Milky Way galaxy in this section. We started that discussion in the previous section, introducing the Milky Way galaxy and its components. We're going to get into a little more of the details, both of the mass content and the history of the Milky Way galaxy in this video. Now, before we get into our galaxy, I want us to take a step back and think about some of the topics that we've covered previously, but looking at them with a new perspective. So, back in Module 3, we learned about Kepler's laws of planetary motion, that a planet that orbits closer to the Sun will also orbit faster, and an orbit farther away is going to be a slower orbit. Kepler figured that out from patterns in the data, and eventually Isaac Newton later on in history determined that what was happening was the force of gravity cares about the distance squared. And so as you get farther away from an, uh, a mass like the Sun, the force that you're experiencing that's kind of whipping you around in your orbit is dropping off um, as a factor of the distance squared. So it drops off very quickly. When we look at that now in a kind of new light, looking specifically at how fast uh, planets are moving in their orbit as a function of where they are, we see this curve drop down significantly. Because what we're seeing is almost all of the mass in the solar system, 99.8% of the mass in the solar system is concentrated in the sun. So as we look at different distances, we aren't adding any additional mass, not really. We're just getting farther and farther away. So gravity is dropping down and slowing us down significantly. The blue uh, diamond here is the Earth. Uh, so the Earth is zooming around in its orbit. And uh, as we continue to go out, it kind of flattens out. And if we were to add other Kuiper Belt objects, other Oort cloud objects, they would again follow this same pattern because it's just the force of gravity that we are really focusing on. So when we think about for the galaxy, we would expect that if we run out of stuff, we have that same drop off. The blue curve shows that same exact drop off that we expect to um, have if once we no longer see stars and galaxies, uh, stars and uh, gas and dust, uh, we would simply be moving away from the same amount of mass. You'll notice that at the very center of the galaxy, we have this kind of sharp rise, because as we're going through this central bulge, we keep adding more and more mass. So unlike the sun, which was kind of a set number that we moved away from, that's a little bit different when the mass is all spread out in the galaxy. But we still expected that to drop off when we no longer saw any visible mass at the edge of the disk. It turns out that the red curve at large distances shows us what we actually found. That rather than dropping off because there was no more mass, the curve stayed steady or rose a little bit because there was significantly more mass that simply was not shining with any visible light. If you have mass that isn't um, making any light, we might call that dark matter. And this was actually the first major evidence for dark matter. Vera Rubin figured this out for the Milky Way galaxy. It turns out this works for all sorts of um, large galaxies, especially spiral galaxies. Huge amounts of dark matter, more than double the material that we can visibly see and count up the gas and dust and stars. So... The orbits at these large distances are telling us what mass is present at those large scales. We'll talk a little bit more about dark matter later on in Module 6. So at the smallest scales within the galaxy, we can also use orbits to give us mass estimates. So when we look at the very center of the central bulge of the Milky Way galaxy, there are stars uh, and gas clouds that seem to be orbiting this kind of hidden object at the very middle. We have called this object Sagittarius A star because it is in the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. Uh, and we track over time the different objects that seem to be orbiting it. Each one of these is an elliptical orbit where Sagittarius A star is at one of the two focus points. And we can watch them over time with a snapshot like this. We can also look at an animation of data um, taken over a long period of time. And what this tells us is each one of those stars is an independent measurement of the mass of this object. Now the mass of this object turns out to be 4.5 million solar masses. So millions of times more mass than our sun. 
And while that sounds large, we always need to take a step back when we aren't sure about big numbers, because Sagittarius A star is a small fraction of the overall mass in the galaxy. Sagittarius A star is a tiny fraction, 0.001% of the whole galaxy's mass. This is not like the solar system where all of the mass is in the middle and we're all moving around it. This is not like that system at all. While this is the object at the very center, every orbit within the galaxy is orbiting all of the mass closer in, and it is much more spread out like we saw it with the rotation curves. They don't look the same, the solar system and the galaxy. So this kind of data tells us the mass, 4.5 um, million solar masses. And then radio observations of the region give us constraints on how big this object can be. They estimate that, scientists estimate that this uh, region, this object that we call Sagittarius A star, is at most 0.3 astronomical units in diameter. So basically out to the orbit of Mercury is where this object is. That is a very tiny space for 4.5 million solar masses and the only object in astronomy that has the density that is required would be a black hole. But this is a supermassive black hole and it is not the same as the black holes we learned about with star formation and evolution in Module 5. This cannot have come from the core collapse of a single star. Uh, and in fact, we are still figuring out in the astronomy community how supermassive black holes can form. Because it is hard to find black holes in the middling range between stellar mass and supermassive. So we've got this object that we'll continue to study, and um, it, will, it will be something that we uh, can find in all large-scale galaxies. It's a little bit outside the scope of our course, so we'll note that it's there. If you've got questions, certainly check in with me, and I'm happy to answer more. But I want to move on now to our next big topic, which is to think about how the Milky Way formed, because that can also tell us a little bit about where the history of Sagittarius A star might have come from as well. So let's take that step back, broader view, and we want to think again about the stars contained in the Milky Way galaxy, because the stars tell us about the environment that they formed in. We're seeing here the sun's absorption spectrum. Remember, all those absorption lines are coming from the elements present in the sun's outer layers. And the fact that there are so many different absorption lines and so much of these different higher elements tell us that the sun formed in this region that already had a lot of pollution of heavy elements. Now the sun, because it's our star and we like to be number one and awesome, is now considered, uh, is labeled, a population one star kind of like all of the different generations with humans, but we're going to call them population one um, for the kind of current generation of stars. Uh, but that kind of puts us in a, in a rough spot because now we have to count backwards if we're counting backwards in time. So population one stars are the youngest generation of stars. They have a lot of similar attributes to each other. They all orbit kind of in the disk of the galaxy, which tells us that that whole generation of stars is forming in the disk where we have all of the gas and dust. And population two stars, which are further back in time, because uh, astronomers like to be confusing, uh, they tend to have a little more eccentric orbits. Population two stars tend to be found in the bulge or the halo, and they don't have nice flat orbits. They all are older because we're talking about that previous generation of stars. And they have less of the heavy elements that we see in the sun because <clears throat> because uh, when they formed, there was less of that extra pollution. So there's a lot of hints at the process of what the Milky Way looked like over time. So the location we mentioned briefly, population one is found in the disk and spiral arms, population two is found in the bulge and halo. Metallicity is the term that astronomers use to describe how much stuff beyond hydrogen and helium is present in the star. So the sun is about 2% metallicity, uh, and that's called metal rich. 2% uh, doesn't seem like a lot, but most of the universe is just hydrogen and helium. So it's a quite significant amount. 
And we're thankful that the sun has all of those heavier elements because the earth and all the stuff in the room around you relies on those heavier elements to exist. Population 2 stars have a lot lower metallicity, which also means they're a lot less likely to have um, rocky planets around them. The orbits also give us a sense of how kind of structured or chaotic the galaxy was when these populations formed. And again, the age is just related to these names that we're giving them, that the population 1 is the current generation of stars and population 2 is uh, younger. Now, I want us to think back to the types of star clusters that we learned about in prior modules. If you want to flip back to your notes, you can. Pause the video for as long as you need, but try to answer the question here at the bottom of the slide. Where are we more likely to be finding population 1 stars compared to population 2 stars? This is an answer, uh, a question that we have all of the tools we need to answer. So do your best and only unpause when you have an answer you feel confident in. Okay, I do hope that you paused because this is a really good critical thinking check for us. We learned that globular star clusters are older. We learned that those clusters um, were found in the bulge and halo, although we didn't really focus on those terms back when we first learned it. So if you flip back to the previous slides or to your notes, maybe it was there. Um, but really importantly, those globular star clusters uh, are a lot of stars that have formed in the past. And we have in the previous video learned that those globular star clusters are found in the halo, which matches the population two stars. On the other hand, open clusters, the example that we had was the Orion Nebula, which is right in the same spur of the spiral arms that we're in. That's definitely in the disk. Those are stars that are just forming. Uh, open clusters, when we learned about them, we said that they are young. They don't live very long as a cluster because they disperse. That is extremely consistent with population one stars. So, Globular star clusters contain population 2 stars, most likely, and open clusters definitely contain population 1 stars. There is also the elusive first set of stars, so the earliest generation of stars that our galaxy would have had that contain only hydrogen and helium, so zero metallicity. These are called population 3 stars, so that's the furthest back our counting goes. And all of the most massive population 3 stars have already died. They've gone supernova or they've left off their planetary nebula. They're done because high mass stars die sooner. And it's only the really dim, low mass M stars in that population that would still be kind of kicking on, doing their thing. And they're hard to find. If they're dim, they're hard to see. Um, and if they're low mass, they don't have strong gravitational effects. There's just very... Um, very high levels of difficulty to find and confirm with high enough quality spectra that there are population three stars out there. But there are astronomers working on that problem. When we think about what it means to have these higher elements, we have learned that stars fuse hydrogen into helium in their cores and then helium into carbon. We briefly saw um, on the end of a previous video in module five that um, Anything beyond iron isn't going to be made through the fusion process of a normal star. And instead, we need to have a high energy event where we can put energy into that process in order to fill out the periodic table. Everything heavier than iron in the periodic table is made of extremely high energy events like supernova or neutron star mergers. We are made of star stuff. The Iron in our blood um, is one of many things that is specifically from stars. That's the place where it gets made. So this graph is now kind of a bigger version of the one shown previously. And I want to break it down briefly. So that darker blue Big Bang fusion, that is going to be a focus of an upcoming um, video in this module where we talk about the formation of the whole universe and hydrogen and helium are pretty much what we had, small amount of lithium. We're gonna skip over cosmic ray fission for now. We've already learned that stars go straight from helium to carbon. And so those elements three, four, five, they're hard to make. They simply are very difficult to make. They're um, not very stable uh, and stars don't make them naturally. 
in their fusion processes. If we look at uh, elements 6 through like 40, mostly we're seeing um, colors consistent with the star processes that we have already learned about. So the green is exploding massive stars. That would be a type 2 supernova. The light blue is exploding white dwarfs. That would be a type 1a supernova. And dying low mass stars, with the picture um, next to it, is telling us we're, we're talking about planetary nebula. And as those um, kind of run into uh, different um, gas clouds, there can be fusion that's sparked in those uh, outer layers as well. And so we've kind of established a lot of the early um, part of the periodic table with things that we learned about through the natural course of a star's lifetime. And then we are only starting to understand, as an astronomy community, through studying gravitational waves, that merging neutron stars and, more rarely, uh, merging black holes can also um, have fusion processes that happen because that's such an intense event when that kind of finally finishes the merger. And that's where the rest of our periodic table seems to come from. So now looping back to cosmic ray fission, Fission is when things break apart. The fact that we see elements 3, 4, and 5 um, at all kind of on Earth is because cosmic rays, so very fast-moving protons from outside the solar system, um, they hit things in our atmosphere and break stuff apart, uh, and we have those lower um, elements much more rarely. So those, those really are not present in high amounts. So we are made of star stuff. The other thing I want us to think about is, uh, as we study these populations, as I mentioned, it is meant to give us a sense of how the galaxy formed. So we have these ways that the elements are um, showing up. So as we see more and more metallicity in newer and newer stars, we are seeing the process of this recycling of material that come from star formation, evolution, and death. So these populations give us snapshots of the different environments that the stars formed in, and it helps us build potential models for how the galaxy formed. Formation models typically fall into two main categories, although the, um, the biggest view that astronomers are starting to come to is that both parts of these categories are probably relevant at different parts of the process. So the first potential category of idea is that the Milky Way galaxy that we know and love came from one single large-scale collapse. A galaxy-sized cloud of gas and dust was there and it collapsed and in the same way that the solar nebula theory, uh, solar nebula model tells us that the collapse of that cloud of um, gas and dust created this disk where all the planets formed out of, this collapse at the galactic scale would form this disk where we now see the spiral arm structure. Things would have um, potentially collapsed out in the halo first, which is why those globular clusters that we see might look older. And so this model is consistent with smaller scales that we've seen. It is also consistent with the relative ages of globular clusters compared to stars in the disk but it is a little hard to suggest that that is the kind of simple only thing that happened. And the reason why it's difficult to suggest that is because when we think about star formation, we needed an outside trigger to cause that collapse. That is difficult to fully um, kind of appreciate as one large galaxy sized cloud of gas and dust had some external event that started the collapse. And we know that there are lots of mergers of galaxies that go on through um, their lifetimes because we see mergers happen all over our sky as we study different galaxies far away from us. So the other category of um, formation model is a bottom-up model where the initial idea for multiple mergers or a merger tree is that there were smaller proto-galaxies that kind of came together and eventually built up what we now call the Milky Way galaxy. It is very likely that there was a collapse of a kind of largest proto-galaxy in the region, and as it kind of ate up other smaller galaxies, um, it grew bigger and bigger. So it is very likely that both of these components are 
part of the Milky Way's history because the Milky Way also has ongoing mergers um, throughout its uh, lifetime and um, evidence of past mergers where when the Milky Way galaxy kind of incorporates a smaller galaxy, the term that astronomy uses for that is galactic cannibalism. There are several globular clusters that are based on their dynamics, the leftover core of a much smaller galaxy that the Milky Way ate up. And we are on track to be in a large-scale collision with Andromeda Galaxy uh, in about 5 billion years. So, um, you know, tune in for that one coming up. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we talk about types of galaxies in further videos. So we'll leave off for here, recognizing that um, the dynamics of the Milky Way are very interesting and still kind of being studied, um, but that collapse and mergers were probably both involved in the process. So I will see you in the next video to talk about different types of galaxies. Thanks for watching.